into Publishers Clearinghouse. All right, I see some hands. That's all right. Maybe, maybe you decided that wasn't good enough, so you decided, well, I'll be a little bit more suave. I'll just go to McDonald's and I'll play the Monopoly game when it happens each year. Have you done that before? I tell you what, you're hoping to win that maybe that million dollar prize or more, and maybe you and your spouse begin to dream of what you could do with that kind of money. All the beautiful things you could have, the new house, the great vacation, you know what I'm talking about? Maybe a better job you could hold out for. Maybe you could sit back and relax in early retirement. How does that sound? It's the stuff that dreams are made of, isn't that right? And I believe it's good to dream. In fact, I think it's good to dream big, quite frankly. Dream about success. It's good to look into the future, kind of take a peek at things. It's good to let the mind drift and think about the possibility of what if. But dreams are only good to a point. There are times when dreams and wishes can get out of control. Sometimes they can cloud reality. Sometimes dreams and wishes, how should I say, they get in the way of objectivity. And quite frankly, there are times when dreams and wishes stand in between us and God. And that's where wishes become a problem. Let me share with you this morning the story of one man who let wishes get between him and God. In fact, his wishes got the best of him. And if you follow in his footsteps, it will get between, in your way, between you and God. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to take them this morning and turn to the book of Numbers. We'll be in the Old Testament. Numbers, the 22nd chapter this morning. Actually, I want you to turn to chapter 23 this morning. Numbers 23, verse 10. And I want you to look at the last half of verse 10. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible this morning. And I want you to notice what is written here. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like what? Be like his or theirs, depending on your translation. Now I want you to let that sink in for a minute. Let my death... Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. It's an interesting statement, isn't it? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his. Now I know that there have been many, many titles that have been given to this particular man and this particular subject. A few of them are... Uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, or that walking, talking, balking mule, or he got what he wanted, but he lost what he had. Now, frankly, those are some provocative titles. But I don't believe the titles tell the whole story. They don't give us the complete picture. And so instead, this morning, I believe we need to zoom in the microscope, so to speak. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us this morning and help us to see and clarify, you might say, some vital truth that we need to make sure of in our own life, our own walk, our own experience. Now, I know many of you may know this story well. You may have even heard about this uh, character since you were in Crater Roll. But the stories from the Bible need to be told over and over again. Can you say Amen. We need to hear these stories so that we never forget the story, never lose the importance of the story as it pertains to our spiritual journey. This is the story of Balaam. He had once been a prophet of God. Now, I want you to remember I said had been, past tense. You see, Balaam had a problem that was common to many. He had apostatized. He had given himself up to covetousness. And in what is amazing, in spite of his apostasy, he still claimed to be the servant of the Most High. Balaam, you may remember, lived in the land of Mesopotamia. And during the time when Israel was making its walk through the desert sands for those 40 years in the wilderness, and knowledge of Balaam was well known throughout the region. In fact, many reported that he still had some kind of, you might say, supernatural powers. 
In fact, a lot of folk, they still had a very high regard for Balaam. In fact, we find that his fame had even reached to the land of Moab. Now, some of you may be saying, well, Pastor, why is the land of Moab so important? Well, in Moab lived a king named Balak. And Balak, looking into the future, began to see something troubling. He was deeply disturbed by the progress of the Israelites as they had been making their way out of, out of Egypt. And he had seen what Israel had done to the Amorites and he was worried. And so Balak developed a plan of action. And with special diplomacy with his friends the Midianites, Balak developed quite an amazing plan. You see, he sent a delegation to Balaam and lavished some very extravagant and costly gifts on him. Tried to persuade him to pronounce a curse upon Israel. You see, Balak was a very shrewd ruler. He knew the importance of importance and influence. In fact, if you'll back up to chapter 22, I'd like to pick up some of the dialogue this morning. Notice this in verse 6, he says... Come now, curse this people for me. Since they are too mighty for me, perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them from the land. And notice what he says here to Balaam. For I know that he whom you bless is what? Blessed. And he whom you curse is what? Cursed. Now my friends, let me be very candid. When the button of Balaam's importance was pushed, Balaam became a pushover. His ears began to perk up. He liked that thought that he could make something happen. He liked those expensive gifts the men had brought. That was exciting to him. But Balaam had a problem. You see, deep down inside of his heart, Balaam knew that he should say no. But he was desperate for those gifts, desperate for that money, desperate for that prestige. And that, that wasn't all. His mind began to work in overtime. And if you'll notice verse 8, notice what it says. Lodge here this night and I will bring back word to you as the Lord speaks to me. And so that's what he did. He went in and he asked the Lord, said, God, I need an answer. And God gave him an answer. The only problem it was, it wasn't the answer that Balaam wanted. You ever had that happen as you've prayed with the Lord and you were determined to talk with God and God gives you the answer and it's not the answer that you want? Well, with the answer, Balaam felt like that the bottom had dropped out of his stomach. He felt low and disappointed. And if you will go with me to verse 13, you will see Balaam's answer. Here's what he says. Go to your own land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. Now, one of the things I have decided in all my years of ministry is how funny people can be from time to time. I've seen people do strange things that absolutely amaze me, and Balaam is absolutely one of those people. You see, Balaam has a very peculiar way here in verse 13 of saying no. Did you ever notice that? He says simply, well, the Lord won't let me go. That's just about like the person who may come up to you at some point and ask you to drink. And you simply reply, my church doesn't drink. It's odd, isn't it? They didn't ask your church to drink. They asked you to drink. Isn't that right? It sounds to me a little bit here in verse 13 that Balaam has an absence, you might say, of personal conviction. He lacks, you might say, intestinal fortitude. It sounds a little bit like, you know, I'd really like to go, but God just won't let me go. You ever, ever heard people say things like that? In fact, I've heard children say things like that before. And so the princes went. They left. They went back and told Balak. They said, well, he's not coming. Now, Balak, being a veteran of very smoke-filled rooms, back rooms. He wasn't moved a bit. He went off to plan B. He wasn't frustrated. He was even more determined for Balaam's help. Why? Because he was in great need. And so we'll discover that he sent even higher princes, 
even costlier gifts to Balaam. In fact, notice verse 16 and 17, if you would, with me. It says, And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus said Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto the very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, and curse this people. Now, Balaam should have been outraged, shouldn't he? He should have felt like he had been slapped in the face. You remember, he had told the first group, those princes, that he could not go. You remember that? And yet, King Balak was saying, in essence, Balaam, that was an awfully good show. Now let's get down to business. Every man has his price. What's yours? But long-suffering... And patient Balaam was not upset. If you look at verse 18, you'll notice what I'm talking about. Balaam replied to the servants of Balak, Though Balak were to give me his house full of what? Silver and gold. I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. Did you catch that? Though Balak were to give me his house full of what? Silver and gold. How did, how did that slip out? Did you catch that? Sounds to me like troubles brewing, don't you think? Notice the next verse, verse 19. He says this, Now please, you also stay here tonight, and I will find out what else the Lord will speak to me. <laughs> it's almost like Balaam loves living on the fence. Have you ever tried to live on the fence before? It's not a very comfortable place, is it? He knows deep down he should say no, but he really wants it. He's begun to slide into the pit. And here is the first warning from the story. You see, my friends, you cannot linger in the presence of temptation. You must flee immediately. Can you say amen? This is... This is just a basic fact of life, isn't it? A basic fact of human nature. You see, that first reaction to moral evil is usually and probably right. Can you say amen? For example, that first flush of shame, that, immoral, that initial moral discomfort that a girl feels when she's propositioned to violate her conscience. Or that initial disgust and anger when a businessman is asked to pull off a shady deal. Or the initial uncleanness and your conscience is screaming when you're asked to violate your principles and to compromise your conscience, your Christian lifestyles. All of these reactions, my friends, are screaming to you, warning to you, don't linger in the presence of temptation. You see, it was so with Balaam and it is so with you and me. The problem is Balaam never saw it and his mistake was fatal. You see, because the longer you linger in the presence of temptation, something happens. You can count on it. It happens every time. Many years ago, a good friend of mine, Dr. Benjamin Reeves, took his daughter to the show of the stars in Chicago. And just about the time they were to start the program, they turned out the lights. And as he sat there with his daughter, he says, well, it got dark and then it got more dark. And he said, then I get to get a little bit excited because he said, just plain dark. It was pitch black in there. And he said, I felt my daughter up beside me. And finally, in desperation, she says, daddy, it's dark in here. And the preacher, being a good at calming his daughter's fears, he put his arm around her and he says, Honey, you'll get used to the dark. You'll get used to the dark. You'll get used to the dark. Are you used to the dark, he said? Oh yes, Daddy, I'm not afraid anymore. Let me ask the question this morning. Have you lingered in the presence of temptation so long that you don't see it for what it is. Are you accustomed to the dark? Are you like Balaam and you feel you must go right on, press to the finish and complete your mistake? If you'll notice in verse 20, 
God decides to play along with Balaam a bit. If you'll notice what it says here. God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise up and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you, you shall do. Interesting that we find that Balaam had so annoyed the men that they left ahead of Balaam and figured he would only say no again. However, if they had stayed, they would have found something unique. They would have found Balaam mounted and ready to go. You see, Balaam was up very early that morning. He was awakened by the alarm clock of his greed. And so he was saddled and ready to go. And Balaam started out. In fact, just last night the Lord had said, Well, any prophet is obedient. You need to go. He reasoned there wasn't any sense in all that money going to waste. And if they're going to honor a prophet, why, who should they honor more than me? And here comes the second warning this morning, my friends. Don't rationalize sin. Don't do it. It's never good, is it? In fact, to rationalize sin is just a big word for finding a reason for doing something that is wrong. It's much like a monster anesthetic that deadens the conscience. And so the embezzler is not stealing. He's, he's just borrowing until he can pay it back. The drug addict is not really hooked. He just wants to try it once. The adulterous husband or wife is not really a cheat. They're not cheap. Rather, what my spouse doesn't know, it won't hurt them. Stealing from the rich is all right because they got more than enough. Hear ye, hear ye this morning. Nothing can be right and wrong at the same time. Can you say amen? If it's wrong the first time, it's wrong, period. Isn't that right? Even if it's repeated multiple times, it's still wrong. If it's wrong the first time, then more money isn't going to make it right. If it's wrong, then a few more extra I love you's will not make it right. Sin is sin. And there is no sense in rationalizing sin. Can you say amen? Well, I want you to note, my friends, how the story goes on. I want you to note how Balaam rides his donkey toward his goal. And as they were nearing the finish, as the donkey was near the end of the journey, the donkey saw something that Balaam didn't. The donkey saw an angel. And as he saw the angel standing there in the road, in the way, he turned into the field. And Balaam, who was blind to the angel, was upset. He beat the donkey back onto the path. Just a little further down the road, the donkey again saw the angel and this time got into a very close corner trying to stay away from the angel and began to crush Balaam's foot against the wall and Balaam in pain and frustration beat the donkey even farther. And then the Bible tells us the donkey saw an angel, the angel a third time and finally, under the unmerciful beating of the prophet, dropped to the ground. And what takes place next is an incredible scene. Balaam is off the donkey. He is hot. He is upset. The men have gone. The money is gone. And now his donkey can't even stand up. And to compound it all, the donkey had the nerve. I mean had the nerve to ask Balaam, why are you beating me? And Balaam was fit to be tied. Why, he could hardly talk. You know how it is. He got so upset, his pitch went way up. Why am I beating you, he said. Why, you're making a fool out of me and you're asking me why I'm beating you? Why, if I had a sword, I'd do something about it. But the donkey wouldn't go for that. No way, that wasn't any kind of reason. And the donkey said to Balaam, why, listen, this has never happened before and I don't know why you're so upset. And Balaam says, what do you mean? Isn't that a fascinating dialogue the Bible tells us? Notice how the donkey said, and Balaam said, and the donkey said. Isn't that strange? Strange that a donkey would talk. Stranger yet, my friends, that Balaam would talk back and never feel anything weird about it. It's as almost as if he was so consumed, so obsessed with sin that he didn't even notice. You see, my friends, sin will carry you to limits of unbelievable behavior. Sin will take you for a long, long ride. The Bible then tells us that Balaam's eyes were open. 
and he saw the angel. Now Balaam was no fool. Immediately he repented, he confessed his sin, and he was told to go on. And he did. Yet in his desperation to still receive the money, he devised a plan to make Israel sin, and he got to see it work. But Balaam received no money, no honor, and failed cursing Israel at the way Balak had intended. Some of you may think, well, pastor, what happened to this man, Balaam? What, what was the reward of the man who prayed, let me die the death of the righteous and let my end be like his? Well, to know, my friends, you must follow me this morning. You must follow me through the years and across the miles of history to a battlefield. You must walk across this field and brave the stench, the carnage, and the horrors of death. You must walk across the bodies, and there you will find dead among the Moabites and the Midianites, one lying there in the robes of the prophet, Balaam. And that brings me to the final warning this morning. You see, my friends, there are consequences for sin. There is a bottom line. Action always precedes consequence. Consequence always follows action. In fact, every line of action has a consequence. It has a place to begin and a place to end. It's just like two ends of a stick. You can't escape the consequences. Now, it may be delayed, but it will happen. Let the word be heard this morning. You cannot juggle moral values. You cannot play with the fire and not get burnt in the long run. Can you say amen? amen? Friends, you've heard the word of the Lord speak this morning, so don't turn your back on him. You see, my friends, the Bible is still true. The law of the harvest still takes place. That which you sow, you shall surely reap. There must be a choice. You must hear Balaam this morning. Hear, Christian friend, this important truth that wishes are not enough. You must choose, therefore, to follow Jesus. Isn't that right? You must choose to follow Jesus and you must choose to be saved. And if you choose Christ, if you choose to follow him, your life will be totally different. Isn't that right? Maybe then it would be better to rephrase Balaam's statement. Instead of, let me die the death of the righteous. Maybe it would be better to say, let me live the life of the righteous. Can you say amen? Amen. And if you will choose, then from the shed blood of Jesus that flows from Calvary, you can be like him. That is, you can be like Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the good news is, it makes no difference about what you did yesterday or what's happening right now. If you will choose Jesus now, he can change your life. The key is, is taking a hold of him, isn't it? Taking a hold of him. And then your future can and will be sure. It will last, if you're trusting in Jesus, for eternity. Now, I don't know about you, but I like the sound of eternity a whole lot better. You see, it's not what's in the immediate that's always the most important. It's the ultimate, isn't it? And so I urge you this morning to think carefully and to remember Balaam. And may your decision be always for Jesus. May your motto always be, Lord, let me live the life of the righteous and let my end be like his.